to start with what scripture says. He did not replace Israel. He did not reject Israel. He is not a covenant breaking God. The Jewishness of the gospel is an essential emphasis of the gospel. We say Jesus is Jewish, but most of the time what we really mean is Jesus was Jewish. So what is the hope in the Holy Land? It's Jesus. Today I'm going to talk to you about one of the most dangerous theologies that exist in the church that most Christians actually believe, but many don't know that they believe it. Today I'm talking about replacement theology, really the replacement model, because as we'll see, it goes by different names. But basically the replacement model is the theology that God shows Israel in the Old Testament, made these promises to them, but that was really just to bring us to Jesus. And now that Jesus died and resurrected, the old covenant's done away with, and now we're in the new covenant. And that's kind of the Old Testament, but we really love to live in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, you know, God talked about Israel and the Jewish people, but now his focus and his affections are on the church and the Christians we've basically replaced Israel. There's no longer a distinction of Jew and Gentile, like Galatians 3 says. Uh, and we now, if you accept Jesus, we are now true and spiritual Israel. The Old Testament is good for allegory, but we now embody it spiritually. In fact, when you hear many Christians talk about the gospel, many times you'll see this way of thinking kind of just rear its head. The gospel is basically God created Adam and Eve in the garden, everything was perfect, but then they sinned and they just sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. And then Jesus came and he died and resurrected. Now we believe in him, we have eternal life. That's not necessarily wrong, but we did just relegate his eternal covenant and his love for Israel in the sin part of the gospel, in the bad part of the gospel. That was just getting us to Jesus. See, many Christians, they don't even realize they think like this. And that's because the Christian church has basically thought this for about 1700 years. So I wanna take a step back and I just wanna go through a brief history of how replacement theology got its grips in the church. So obviously we start with Jesus, who's a Jewish man, the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, son of David, son of Abraham is the, what Matthew's gospel tells us. All of his followers are Jewish. And when he dies and resurrects, all of his followers are still Jewish and they still maintain Jewish lives. They still eat kosher. They still uh, uh, follow Torah. But then something crazy happens, which is they realize all the scriptures about the nations coming in is being fulfilled. So now the Gentiles are able to come into the family of God. Paul talks about this in Romans 11, that there's a tree. It's basically the family tree. And we are now grafted into that family tree. It's not a new tree. God didn't plant a new tree. It's the same tree. The roots of that tree are the covenants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The natural branches, Paul says, are the Jewish people. And we are the wild olive shoots that are grafted into that tree. But that starts to get a little bit confusing when the Gentiles go from the minority of this primarily Jewish way of life to the majority. And that really happens in around 300 AD, especially when the Roman Emperor Constantine converts overnight and the Roman Empire essentially becomes Christian overnight. And now it is a complete flop and the Gentiles are the majority by far. What many people don't realize is Constantine was actually pretty anti-Semitic. So he calls a council in 325 AD or CE and he invites all of these bishops from the Roman Empire, Christian, you know, Jesus following bishops, but he doesn't invite the 120 Jewish Jesus following bishops. So they're excluded from this meeting. They talk at the Council of Nicaea and they bring us the Nicene Creed. 
And there's many good attributes about the Nicene Creed. But one of the things that isn't mentioned is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the creator. There's a high Christology, but it's void of all connection to the Jewish foundation. Constantine said at this meeting of Nicaea, let us have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, the murderers of our Lord. So you can see the lens is becoming clear. They saw themselves as the true spiritual Israel and the Jewish people were the ones that rejected Jesus. And basically from 325 on, replacement theology was firm in the church. We are the new spiritual Israel. And from 325 uh, till, you know, the modern church, you had to choose, are you Jewish or Christian? And we define them very differently and kind of the opposite because the Jewish side was, uh, it was founded in what you do. I, I live a Jewish life. I follow Torah. I obey Torah. I obey kosher laws. And I don't believe in Jesus. That's how the, the Jewish side was therefore framed after 325. And the Gentile side was the opposite. We are, we are founded in what we believe. We believe in Jesus. And we're not by what we do. We don't do the law. We don't do the Old Testament because I'm under the New Testament. I'm under a new covenant. So there's this divide. It's exclusivity. Now, the reason I said that this is one of the most dangerous theologies is because where it leads. It may take years. It may take centuries. But where it leads is the Holocaust. Because you can only believe so long that we are the true chosen people before you start to get this idea that, well, they're the ones that rejected Jesus. They're the anti-Jesus. And it leads to the Holocaust. Many people don't realize Martin Luther, the great church uh, reform, reformer, who did amazing things. God used him to, to do the Protestant Reformation and break off from the Catholic Church, which had uh, many sins at that time. But we don't often learn about, and I went to Bible school. I never learned about the side of Martin Luther that was terribly anti-Semitic, who at the end of his life wrote a book called Of the Jews and Their Lies. This is the 1600s. So we started at 325. Now we're in the 1600s. Martin Luther says this in his book, their houses should be razed and destroyed. Their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatries, lies, cursing, and blasphemies are taught be taken from them. Rabbis forbidden to teach henceforth of pain of loss of life and limb, even if they were punished in the most gruesome manner, that the streets ran with their blood, that their dead would be counted not in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions, they still must insist on being right. That's Martin Luther. And that's the 1600s. Well, Hitler got to his chance to try and complete that job. Now, thankfully, after the Holocaust, the church had to take a step back and say, maybe we messed up. Maybe we've misinterpreted scripture. Maybe we need to rethink God's heart towards Israel. But I hate to tell you that the replacement model is thriving again. Now, most churches and Christians would not say, I believe in replacement theology. Some would, but that seems a little aggressive. So it's shifted terminology. Like when, uh, when I was a kid, I watched a Spider-Man animated TV show. And Spider-Man, he teamed up with Deadpool. But Deadpool wanted to kill the bad guys. Spider-Man didn't like that. So he said, what if we just unalive them? S sounds way better, right? way less aggressive. So that's kind of what we've done. It's not replacement theology, it's supersession theology. We didn't replace Israel, we superseded them. Fancy word for replace, I know. Or we didn't supersede them, Jesus just fulfilled them. So Israel had this calling and they had these promises and Jesus fully embodied those and he fulfilled them. Because Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill them but we don't really know what fulfill means. So we're like, I guess it means abolished. No, he came not to abolish. 
but to fulfill. So you'll see supersession theology, um, fulfillment theology, but I want to spend the rest of my time just talking about the four things that replacement theology does. And all of them have the letter D, which at Gateway, Pastor Roberts told us, if there's alliteration in your message, it's from God. So I have four points. These are four things that replacement theology does. The first thing it does is it defames the character of God. It defames the character of God because what it tells us about God, if that's true, it means that God is a covenant replacing, promise breaking God. Does that sound like God? The one who made an eternal covenant with the Jewish people the one who will never leave you or forsake you. Does that sound like him? A promise breaker, a covenant replacer? Genesis 17, 17, or sorry, 17, seven says, I am establishing my covenant between me and you, along with your descendants after you, generation after generation as an everlasting covenant. I looked up what everlasting means, you'll never guess. Everlasting, lasts forever an everlasting covenant to be God for you and your descendants after you. Yes, Israel breaks the covenant and we all sin, but God doesn't abandon us. That's why Romans 11 starts with this question. This is what Paul says. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Could it be clearer? He did not replace Israel. He did not reject Israel. He is not a covenant breaking God. So the first thing it does is it defames God's character. The second thing it does is it dodges scripture. There's two kinds of scriptures I like to say that the replacement model, whether it's supersessionism or fulfillment theology, really likes to use. I call them dot, dot, dot scriptures and dodge, dodge, dodge scriptures. Dot, dot, dot scriptures are the ones that will tell you the first half, but we're not going to finish it because we don't like what the you know, end of it said. For example, um, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his power to salvation to all who believe. Dot, dot, dot. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Or when Gabriel comes to Joseph and he says, Mary is pregnant, that is by the Holy Spirit. You are to call his name Yeshua, Jesus, for he will save. Dot, dot, dot. He will save his people. Who are his people? The Jewish people, Israel. We're like, someone tell Gabriel that he came for the world and me. We want to we want to be the main character of the story. And so it can't be just about Israel. My favorite dodge, dodge, dodge scripture, Matthew 15, 21, behold, a Canaanite woman, a Gentile from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severe, severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. We're like, but where's the love? And his disciple came and begged him saying, send her away for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We're like, get that out of here. I want to talk about that verse. Someone please tell Jesus his mission to the world. But we don't like that he came for Israel. His followers were all Jewish. He was Jewish. It blows my mind that In the 1970s, there was a theological book talking about the the Jewishness of Jesus. People lost their minds. What were we reading? I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the only way we can make that make sense with a replacement model is, well, he just did that so that he could, you know, save the whole world. Which there's truth to that. Genesis 12, Abraham says, or God says to Abraham, I'm, you know, making a covenant with you so that you can bless the nations. But even Uh, N.T. Wright, who's an amazing theologian, he talks about, you know, Israel was really the messenger. They were the mailman and they had this package from God they were supposed to deliver to the world, but they thought that the message was for them. But it was really just for the whole world. They were just the messenger? Really? I don't know because God says 
They're his firstborn, Exodus 4.22. The apple of his eye, Zechariah 2. His special treasure, Deuteronomy 7.6. My wife, Isaiah 54. My glory, Isaiah 46. And my nation, Isaiah 51. Look, I love my mailman. (laughs) But I'm not calling him my special treasure. But see, replacement theology makes Israel means to an end. He had to do that so he could get to us, the real main characters of the story. If that's true, if Israel's just the means to an end, why is Jesus weeping over Jerusalem? Because his mailman? No, it's because they're his special treasure. So it dodges scripture, defames the character of God. The third thing is it distorts the Jew-Gentile distinction. If you've watched any of our videos on YouTube, one of our number one comments is Galatians 3. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. Dot, dot, dot. (laughs) They don't say that part. I added that. Because it's another dot, dot, dot scripture. Yes, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. And there's no longer slave or free, and there's no longer male or female. No one's arguing there's no longer male or female. In fact, the world is trying to argue that. And what is the church standing for? Uh Uh-uh. The Bible makes very clearly there is male and female. They should just shout Galatians 3. But we don't use that logic towards the male-female distinction, maybe because Galatians 3 is not talking about breaking down a distinction, it's talking about breaking down a barrier in a time where patriarchy was valued more than matriarchy, where free was valued more than slave, and where Jew was valued more than Gentile. No more, for we are all one in Christ Jesus, and there is no more barrier to who can become part of that family tree. Because God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you're not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're not in that family tree. But now we have access because of what Jesus did. But of course, there's still distinction. In fact, male and female and Jew and Gentile are very similar because when male and female enter into a new covenant, marriage, what does the Bible say they become? One flesh. Yet we know that doesn't mean they're this, you know, non-binary, non-gender, you know, little blob. No, they're still male and female, but there's a new unity that wasn't there before. And they're supposed to walk in that unity, serve one another, humble one another. Any married people in the room, maybe cause a little bit of friction, but it blesses one another. When Jew and Gentile come under a new covenant, wink, wink, the one Jesus said, I come to bring a new covenant. The Bible doesn't say they're one flesh. It says they're one new man. I wonder what language they're thinking about. Just like male and female, one flesh, Jew and Gentile, one new man. And we're like, ah, one new man, no longer Jew and Gentile. No, of course, Jew and Gentile. But there's a new unity that wasn't there before. They're supposed to bless one another. They're supposed to serve one another. Maybe cause a little bit of healthy friction. But there's a new unity they are able to walk in. That is what the church is supposed to be. The ecclesia is this revelation that Jews and Gentiles are doing this together now. What a beautiful sight. Unless the Gentiles say, no, actually, Jews have to become Gentiles. They need to accept Jesus and be Christian and then denounce Judaism. We are breaking the covenant God created us to walk in. Which, my last point, why does Satan want to distort the Jew-Gentile distinction through replacement theology so he can destroy the Jew and Gentile partnership. Distort the distinction to destroy the partnership. I want to show you a scripture that I always misinterpreted. Romans 8, 15 says, you receive the spirit of adoption, praise the Lord, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He's talking to Gentiles, right? We're we're the ones that are adopted in. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah, joint heirs with Christ, what most translations say. I always thought that meant me and Jesus, we are joint heirs and we're gonna do life together now. It's me and him, we're joint heirs. If that's what Paul meant, We don't need the word joint. 
we would just be heirs together. Me and him. So who am I a joint heir with? And now you might think like, uh, I'm reaching. <laughs> Let me show you. This is Paul in Ephesians 3. And he is so excited to share this revelation. Have you ever read something before and you're like, no one's ever seen this. This is, I'm the first. I think that's the kind of feeling Paul had. Listen to how excited I think he is to share this. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. This is so good. You can't, you're going to love this. Get your pens out. This is what Paul's saying. I, I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which has not been made known to people of other generations as it has now been revealed by the spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. Verse six, the mystery is, are you ready? That through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Jew and Gentile are joint heirs with Messiah. We are supposed to be doing this together. And until we take off the lens of replacement theology, we will never be able to walk the way God created us to walk side by side as Jew and Gentile to the return of our Lord. Thank you.